Well, aloha everyone, and welcome to our second lecture here at People in Nature, or Biology 110, here at Chaminade University. Today we're going to be investigating Unit 2, which involves the discussion of the sustaining aquatic biodiversity. So several of the pressing questions that are involved in terms of maintaining these aquatic resources um, is that, first and foremost, what do we know about the bi aquatic biodiversity, and what are the economic and ecological importances? Secondarily, how are human activities affecting aquatic biodiversity? And this is actually very difficult because a lot of times the human activity has been going on for a long while, and therefore we don't necessarily know what kind of biodiversity we had prior to that activity. But we want to talk about protective measures. How do we sustain marine biodiversity? How do we enact laws that are going to help protect these regions? And how can we manage and sustain the marine fisheries on the planet? We also want to talk about wetlands. How can we protect, sustain, and restore our wetlands? And how can we protect, sustain, and restore lakes, rivers, and freshwater fisheries? So we're going to talk about all of this, all of this in the next couple slides. First, we're going to start by traveling to Lake Victoria. So Lake Victoria has a problem, a very large problem. It's lost over half of its endemic fish species to an introduced fish called the Nile perch, which is highly predatory. So since the introduction of the Nile perch, Lake Victoria has lost approximately 200 of their 400 original endemic cyclic species. They become entirely extinct since the introduction of the Nile perch because as we just mentioned, the Nile perch eats other fish. So there's multiple different reasons for the loss of biodiversity. They lost over 200 species since the introduction of the Nile perch. Um, additionally, the lake also secondarily experienced something called algal blooming. And we'll talk about that in and of itself. It's from a process called eutrophication, which occurs when nutrients end up running into the water, and therefore the algae have a huge nutrient source to feed on. And when the algae ends up dying, because it's just eaten all of its nutrients, then it ends up blocking all of the sunlight and also being degraded by um, something like bacteria and microorganisms that are then going to cause um, dead zones or a loss of oxygen in those regions. We also have something called the water hyacinth, which is an invasive species as well, and it's also blocked off sunlight and deprived oxygen for the waters below. Currently, the Nile perch species is actually in decline because it's eaten the entirety of its own food supply. Um, however, that's not going to bring back those African cichlids that were originally found in the Lake Victoria region. Unfortunately, we know very little about biodiversity in the world's marine and freshwater systems. In fact, we know more about deep space than we do about the lower regions of the ocean. Um, and the highest amount of marine biodiversity occurs in places that we really haven't had access to yet, things like the deep ocean floor. We also have a high biodiversity in coral reefs and estuaries, which are fairly well studied. And we generally know that biodiversity is usually higher in surface waters and along the coastline because of habitat and food source variety. However, the deep ocean floor presents a specialized set of challenges which also induces increased biodiversity. Now, the world's marine and freshwater systems provide ecological and economic services to their environment. So they are very, very important. Waters and rivers are very important. In fact, 50% of the world's people depend on the ocean as their source of food. This is an example of a fishing prow in Indonesia. Here's fishers found in Lake Victoria. And here's a Georgian shrimp trawler, which trawls the bottom and pulls up shrimp for consumption. Approximately 90% of the fish in the world spawn in coral reefs, mangrove swamps, coastal wetlands, or rivers. And here's just showing you that the mangrove swamps start have several different types of habitat depending on the level of the tide. So at low tide, it's entirely exposed and can have small uh, mammals, for example, hiding out inside these mangrove forests. And as the water ends up reaching higher and then higher, we can end up with a different biodiversity. And this means that we have to have huge research efforts, both at low and high tides. Research is vital in these regions so that we can help maintain the biodiversity in these regions. And this is actually research by kayak, which is kind of a neat thing about this type of science. Unfortunately, human activities are responsible for destroying, degrading, and disrupting a large percentage of the world's water. Our coastal systems, our marine systems, and our freshwater ecosystems have all been damaged by human populations. Over 20% of the coral reefs have been destroyed, and sea levels have risen almost 25 centimeters in the past 100 years. Additionally, we've destroyed over a third of the mango forest, 
due to the need for shipping lanes, etc. And another threat to the mangrove forest includes the shrimp farming, which we just talked about, trawlers, which basically devastate the entire, um, uh, entire ocean floor. So a trawler net passes by it, it's going to remove everything, not just the shrimp, but other things in the ecosystem and it's going to leave very little in its wake. Now, not all trawlers are created equal. East Coast shrimp trawlers are a little bit different because they work in open areas where there isn't a whole lot of things to damage in the first place. So although they work in the same mechanism, there's less to damage. So therefore, they don't do as much damage. Other, other impacts on aquatic biodiversity include invasive species. And bioinvaders are actually blamed for about two-thirds of our fish extinctions. So just like we were talking about Lake Victoria, that Nile Perch is an example of a bioinvader. So that would be an organism that comes into an ecosystem and outcompetes all of the native organisms. And this is very important. You think about it just being fish, but really it Im impacts humans as well. Half of the people of the world live in a coastal zone or near a coastal zone. And 80% of the pollution that goes into the ocean water comes from the land. It comes from land-based human activities. This is unfortunate because every year we dump things from ships and things end up washed up into the ocean from the land and all of this threatens marine life. One of the other major threats to the oceans or and the waterways is agricultural pollution. We add nitrogen in the form of nitrate fer fertilizers, we add phosphorus, we add potassium. This is a combination known as potash and it's going to be added to the ag lands in order to increase its ability to create more uh, products, so increase the yield of our farmlands. However, everything excess is going to end up washed off into the waters, and this is very bad because it causes something called red tide. So red tide is an algal bloom that's toxic, um, and it's exacerbated or it may, it's made worse by something called eutrophication. So eutrophication is defined as excess nutrients in the water. So the water basically has gotten the excess nutrients, in this case, from terrestrial sources, so from agricultural runoff. And what that does is it eventually is going to deplete the water of oxygen. And it does that by um, basically first we, the nutrients are going to create more and more and more of this algal bloom. Then the algal bloom is going to subside once it's consumed all the nutrients. And then the microorganisms that are there destroying the algal bloom end up depleting the water of oxygen. And that creates a dead zone, so an area where no life or no bio life are able to be sustained. So this is a big problem. Another big problem is overfishing. Approximately 75% of our commercially valuable marine fish are either overfished or fished near a sustainable limit. So what's a sustainable limit? So a sustainable limit is a limit at which we are able to replenish the population for the next generation. If we go past that, we end up in a population decline. So big fish are the fish that are, most of these 75% are big fish. Big fish are actually becoming very scarce, and smaller fish are going to be following suit very quickly. Unfortunately, we have fish that we catch that's called bycatch, and it's not the actual targeted fish, even though it might be something that we could eat. We generally don't consume it, and so we're going to throw that fish away. Generally, when they throw that fish away, by the time they've gotten to it, it's already dead. So it is not like they were able to return to the ecosystem. We're just killing off that fish for the purposes of killing the fish, not even for the purpose of harvesting it for food. Additionally, we needlessly kill sea mammals and birds in the droves, and this, all of this contributes to major extinction events in our oceans and in our waterways. Now, commercial depletion is defined as when a species has been overfished to the point where they're no longer able to be profitable for the fishery. And generally what that means is that they'll go to another fish species and hopefully that will allow that fish to repopulate. However, some, some stocks have been so low that they will never be able to replenish themselves. So the tragedy of the commons is something that occurs quite often, particularly with native peoples. And basically what happens is too many people use the same resource. And they use it in a way that makes sense for them personally or as individuals, but it's going to result in the collapse of the resource for everyone. And so basically what that means is that everyone is doing what's best for them, but no one is doing what's best for the whole. And that's called the tragedy of the commons. And so the overview of e ecological restoration is to think of the good of society as a large or as the ecosystem as a large and not of the individual per se. So in terms of commercial fisheries, we have something called natural capital degradation. And basically what happens is that these fish end up, we end up with lower and lower amounts of these fish populations because commercial fisheries are depleting multiple marine species at a high enough rate that we're not able to be sustainable. And so that means that these fish are going to become commercially extinct. And that means that no one wins, not the fisheries because they no longer have a product, not the individuals who are consuming the fish because they no longer have a food source. So this is not something that's sustainable for anyone. No one wins. These are all of the different types or many of the different types of fishing that are performed in our oceans today. We have fish farming in cages. 
We also have aquaculture and deep sea aquaculture cages. We also have something called purse line aquaculture. So basically the fish believe that they're free, but we're able to harvest them whenever we choose. Additionally, we have um, ways that we are able to catch fish that are living naturally in the ocean. For example, trawl lines in a trawl bag that's going to go behind something like a trawler. As I mentioned, the trawler is going to end up laying on the ground and can be very, it can end up reaching the ocean floor in the, in the shoreline areas and that can devastate the coral reefs. Additionally, we cheat. We use spotter airplanes, we use sonar, and these are all ways that we can find out where the fish schools are located in the open ocean. And we also use long lines that have hooks off of them. Well, this will be left in there for a, long, for a pretty long period of time and then pulled up. And anything that's caught that's able to be harvested will be, cons you know, will be sold. Everything else will be thrown back as bycatch. All right, so lots of different ways in which we can harvest the fish from the oceans. So what are some of the barriers mm -hmm. to the protection of these species? Well, first and foremost, humans are increasing their impact faster than we are able to legally jur have jurisdiction in these areas. So faster than we can protect the areas of aquatic biodiversity. Also, the general citizen is pretty much unaware. So someone who is having a construction a site isn't necessarily thinking of the aquatic biodiversity of the streams and rivers that are surrounding that region. Um, and every day the human ecological footprint is expanding further and further and further. Additionally, because ocean damage is so far away from everyone's everyday life, most of the damage that's done is not visible on a day-to-day, -day, the way something like littering or pollution of your waterways might be visible. And so therefore the ocean is something that's just not on the forefront of most people's mind and also, it's been pretty much viewed as an inexhaustible resource for so long that even though it's obvious now that it is not inexhaustible and we can absolutely deplete these fish, po fish populations, it's incorrectly assumed that these are an inexhaustible resources and so no one even considers the idea that they might be causing decimation to these populations. But the good news is, guys, protective measures do work. So the more laws we put in place, the more treaties that we get signed internationally, and the more education and outreach that we perform can actually help us reduce and prevent extinction of marine species. Uh, another protective measure is the implementation of turtle exclusion devices. And yes, that is an exam question. These are called TEDs, and they've been required since 1989 for anyone that's doing offshore shrimp trawling. And what that means is that there's a, a weird little noise that comes out that the turtles really don't like, and they will migrate away from them prior to the shrimp trawler taking in its haul. And so that's going to help us eliminate or reduce the amount of turtles that are caught in these nets. Additionally, economics is everything. So once we can demonstrate to populations that the sea turtle tourism brings in three times as much money as a sale of turtle products, people generally will turn around and stop killing the turtles if they're able to bring in more money. So it's always coming down to the bottom dollar. And you'll hear me say this a lot of times throughout this class, that we are only going to be able to make these economic impacts if we're able to, I'm sorry, these ecological impacts, if we're able to show that they have an economic benefit as well. Unfortunately, six of the seven turtle species are actually threatened because of human activities. Many activities include things like beach development, for example, or egg harvesting, or unfortunately, jewelry made of the turtle shell, like turtle shell combs, um, or leather made of the turtle shell flippers is still sold in certain countries. So we want to make sure that we're able to reduce the, um, the activities that are going to hinder the repopulation of these specific organisms. We just talked about whaling, or we will talk about whaling next, it'll be an entire unit. Um, but in 1986, the International Whaling Commission banned commercial whaling. And again, this has led to the restoration of several, not all, but several whale populations. Unfortunately, despite that ban, there are several countries like Japan, Norway, and Iceland that still kill whales for scientific purposes and sell their meat commercially. So this is something that we'll talk about in Unit 3. Um, and we will talk specifically about Sea Shepherds, who are an organization that goes out into the waters where Japan is performing these illegal whaling practices and basically performs nuisance activities like smoke bombs and stink bombs to try to help slow down or deter these ships from being in those regions. Um, but unfortunately, it hasn't done a great job. Japan has a significant whaling industry and a whale meat market. This is an overview of the whale species diversity. We have multiple different sets of whales. You can see they range in size. Some of them are much larger, larger than other whales. They also range in their habitat, so they're found all over the world. And they also range in the ability to consume their food. So tooth whales are going to use their teeth, just like we do as mammals. Baleen whales use baleen, which is a, a basically a screen. So they're going to suck in a bunch of water, filter out all the water, 
through that screen and anything that's left in the baleen is their food and they'll be able to use that as their food source. So while these protective measures work, more measures are needed. As it stands, our protected marine reserves area are less than 0.3% of the world's oceans. Remember, all these organisms are migratory, or most of them are migratory, so they're going to migrate in and out of these protective regions um, kind of at will. But marine reserves work. So all we need to do is make more of them. Studies show that protected areas allow fish populations to increase, sometimes double. The size of the average fish grows by almost a third because they're not being harvested off as they grow. Reproduction rates triple and species diversity increases by a quarter. Um, and so this is all very important, right? The more of these marine reserves we can get out there, the increase in biodiversity we can, the more increase in biodiversity we can sustain. And I want to point out that this is kind of a community effort. If the communities work together to manage their coastal areas, you have a much better plan, a much better integrated plan, and a much better effective outcome. So ideally, and I know these are very idealist goals, we need a complete overhaul of the ocean policy and management here in the United States. Some of the ideas for what could be included in this revamp include creating a national oceans agency, developing a national policy on ocean and uh, marine biodiversity and conservation, increasing the budget for ocean research, creating more marine reserves, right? The ones that we have work, let's make a whole network of them. And reorientation of fisheries management, and this is going to be a reinvention of the wheel entirely, but if we can reinvent fisheries so that we are making them more functional in terms of the ecosystem and not just in terms of the particular fish that they are looking to catch, then we can help modify and increase biodiversity in the entire ecosystem. And of course, this all goes along with an increase in public awareness. Most people are blissfully unaware of the fact that we are depriving our oceans of the organisms very, very, we're depleting our organisms of biodiversity very quickly. Really, it comes down to oversight and protective measures. We really want to try to figure out as many ways as possible to manage the fisheries in a sustainable and a protective way. So some fishing communities are going to help regulate themselves, and others work with the government to regulate them. But unfortunately, most of the modern fisheries have weakened the ability of coastal communities to regulate their own fisheries because they have lobbyists and they are actually working against the interest of the people who live in the coastal communities. So the objective would be to sustain the, the fisheries by building and protecting the populations of whatever our desirable species are or our endangered species, preventing overfishing, and decreasing the populations of invasive species. So we can do this. We can sustain freshwater fisheries by building and protecting populations of desirable species, again, preventing overfishing, and decreasing the populations of those that have invaded and are therefore consuming or competing with the natural species in their native environment. These are just some ideas for sustainable fishery management. If we were able to implement these regulations, such as fishery regulations, to set catch limits below the maximum sustainable yield. So currently, we are over, if not touching, on the sustainable yield. We want to make it below that maximum sustainable yield so that we can recover these populations. And that's going to take monitoring and enforcement of the regulations already on the books. Additionally, you got to hit them in the pocket. You'll hear me say this several times. You have to hit the economic bottom line in order to produce change. Um, and so we can do that by reducing or eliminating the subsidies that are given to these fishing communities and charge fees for harvesting fish from publicly owned waters. Additionally, we can certify sustain more sustainable fisheries to so try to convert the fisheries that we already have to sustainable practices. And creating sanctuary or protected areas, areas that are no, where no fishing is allowed, more marine protected areas. And um, in order to do that, we'll be using coastal management. Additionally, on the consumer side, we want to be able to label the fish that are sustainably harvest. Give the consumer the option to pay a couple dollars more, but to make sure that they get something that doesn't harm the sea turtles, for example. And we want to get the information out there in terms of which fish are overfished and threatened so that people can make conscious food choices so they're not consuming those fish at market. Last but not least, we have to address the idea of bycatch. Bycatch is where we are losing a lot of our organisms. So we want to use wider mesh nets instead of smaller mesh nets. That allows smaller fish to escape and survive and then reproduce. Additionally, the net escape devices are going to be crucial. So currently, we don't; those are not required. They're just something that people can choose to use if they want. And net escape devices are regions where birds and sea turtles are able to escape a net instead of ending up dying inside there. And another practice is that people or uh, fisheries, fishermen, will throw back edible or marketable fish that don't quite meet their parameters so that they can save room on their boat to be able to have all the marketable fish. And so we can ban the bycatch 
trashing back the bycatch and also throwing any edible or marketable fish back into the ocean. We can increase our aquaculture, so basically restricting the locations for the fish farm and also controlling the pollution more strictly in those regions. And we can use specifically herb herbivorous fish species, so fish that are only going to be eating plants as opposed to fish that are going to be eating other fish. And we can focus on keeping foreign invaders out of our water. One of the ways we can do this is by taking, um, it can either kill the organisms in the ballast water, and we can do this by adding chemicals to them, etc. Let me back up. Ballast water is water that goes into the bottom of the boat during um, transit, so from one location to another. And if we filter out those organisms from the ballast water, kill the organisms, or just do a dump and replace, where we dump the ballast water far at sea and replace with deep sea water, which is unlikely to have organisms that can survive in the coastal environment. Now let's switch gears for a little bit, and we can talk about wetland loss and how to protect, sustain, and restore our wetlands. We've already lost over 50% of our original wetlands and more are being lost by the day. And we need to make sure that we require government permits. So currently this is something that is typically um, optional to be able to fill in the wetlands. Um, you have to get a permit from your local government, but you don't necessarily have to go through the higher level orders of government. Um, and we do have these re requirements in place, but we have a lot of people who are having blowback. So there's a lot of attempts to weaken that protection for the wetlands. There's also something called mitigation banking, and mitigation banking is basically saying, okay, you can develop the wetlands here as long as you create an area over there that is preserved. So as long as you create an equal area of wetland or restore an equal area of wetland in a different region. Um, and this generally ends up setting itself up for failure, but we do have um, specifically good examples like the coastal Georgia salt marshes where we have had success with mitigation banking. However, in order to sustain and restore our wetlands, we need serious policy changes. We need to protect our existing wetlands. We need to steer development away from existing wetlands. And using mitigation banking only as a last resort instead of using it as a common measure. We also need to require the creation and evaluation of new wetlands any time that we're going to destroy an existing wetlands. Remember, these wetlands are very, very important habitats for a lot of different species. So it's really important for us to sustain them and try to restore any of them that have been previously degraded and attempts to control invasions by non-native species are going to be vital. And you're going to see this pretty much across the board. We always want to make sure that the native species get first rights to those habitats. So an example that I like to talk about here is the Florida Everglades. It's the world's largest ecological restoration project, and it's still in process right now. And the attempt basically is to undo the damage inflicted on the Everglades by humans. Originally, we had large volumes of water that were flowed through the park, and we ended up diverting them out for crops and for cities. Um, and that led to the destruction and elimination of approximately 90% of the park's wading birds and other vertebrate populations are down by 75 to 95%. Additionally, we end up with eutrophication, so we end up with those algal blooms that we just talked about. So there were a lot of areas that they had to address, and they had to call in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in order to restore the Everglades and the water supplies back to normal conditions. And although restoration efforts are still ongoing, it's a very promising outlook. Now I'm going to talk about lakes and rivers for a second, and we'll talk about dams speci specifically. And although dams are very important in terms of hydroelectric power um, and other benefits to the humans, it also can be pr problematic in terms of disruption of the ecological services that are provided by the rivers to the native species. Um, for example, salmon. Salmon need to m swim upriver to spawn. And then their babies are found in the rivers, and then they grow up as they head up down the river, and then the adults are found in the ocean, and then when the adults are ready to spawn again, they go back up the river to their original spawning grounds. And dams, as you might imagine, especially something with really high height, make it very difficult, if not impossible, for the salmon to reach their spawning grounds. And an example that I'm using here is the Columbia River that has 119 dams along it. And they've seen a sharp reduction of wild salmon. In fact, 94% of the wild salmon that used to be there prior to the dams are no longer present. And although we've spent a lot of money on unsuccessful efforts to save the salmon, we still haven't found any reasonable alternatives. And you may have seen something that's like a salmon pump, basically, like a luge. It's a very fun video. You can quickly look it up. Basically, what happens is they have um, people who sit at the bottom of these dams and collect the large salmon prior to spawning and send them into these tubes, kind of like a, a mail tube or a tube at the bank that gets sucked up by pressure. And they are basically pulling the salmon up to the top of the dam to begin um, to be able to reach the next hurdle. But even if we do this, we still are going to have large amounts of salmon that aren't going to make it to the spawning grounds. 
So the only way for us to be able to restore the native spawning grounds back to their original capacity would be to remove the hydroelectric dams. But the hydroelectric dams serve as electrical sources for the community, so there's severe economic implications that arise from this. So it's a very complicated and tricky matter. But rivers serve more than just an economic benefit in terms of what kind of fish you can get out of it, etc. They have serious ecological services. First and foremost, they take nutrients from the top of the river out to the sea, and that helps sustain the eco ecology of the ocean environments and coastal fisheries. They also deposit silt as they mo move down. We have silt that's deposited along the delta regions, which allows for a highly fertile environment. Additionally, they help serve to purify water, so the water runs through several sets of sand and gravel, etc., and eventually ends up purer than it was to begin with. And they feed into the wetlands, so that helps renew and re nourish the wetlands and provide habitats for wildlife, both the rivers and the wetlands as well. So there's a lot of ecological services to rivers, and we want to make sure that we preserve them. So in 1968, a federal law was put forth and signed into action that protects a small percentage of the U.S. rivers from dams and other forms of development. And it's called the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. And... While it protects the wild and scenic rivers, the definition of wild and scenic rivers is very specific. So wild rivers are untamed and entirely inaccessible except by trail. They've never been widened at any point. They've never been straightened at any point. No dredging, no filling or damming at any point, and no motorboats are allowed in these regions. Those are considered wild rivers. The only way that you can get to this river is by a trail. A scenic river, however, is actually going to be accessible by other regions. They're considered to be great scenic value and accessible by some, but not many, so a few roads, free of all dams, and mostly undeveloped. And again, we're not going to allow any motorboats in these scenic rivers. Um, recreational rivers are a lot more accessible and are allowed to have some dams or shore development and motorboats are allowed. So while we're saving the wild rivers and the scenic rivers, recreational rivers are not covered by this act. And unfortunately, only 2% of the U.S. rivers are entirely free-flowing. That means there's no dams, etc. So 90% of them have been dammed for hydroelectric power. And because of the definitions of what it takes to become a wild river or a scenic river, only 0.2% of U.S. rivers are protected by the National Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. Um, now I wanted to leave you with a little bit of an uh, upbeat. I know that I just hit you hard with a lot of negative information, and the, the, tr the truth is that there's a lot of negative information out there, but I want to hit hammer home that we can make a difference. The whole point of this class is to learn how you can make an impact. So I want to talk about something called reconciliation ecology, which is kind of like a, um, a silver lining in terms of how we can make a difference. So currently only 5% of the earth is actually protected. And so therefore on that other 95%, we need to learn to live with the other species that surround us in order to increase biodiversity. And so reconciliation ecology is basically a way in which we can maintain new habitats for these populations to allow us to maintain biodiversity in places where people live, where we work, where we play. And some examples of that would be ways that protect critical pollinators, such as butterflies and bees, so making butterfly shelters or bee shelters, etc., also bat shelters, right? So lots of different organisms can be saved just by giving them a habitat within our communities. Additionally, communities as a whole would have to make these agreements, but if you agree to reduce things like pesticides on your lawns, your fields, golf courses, etc., then you can end up with an increase in biodiversity inside those regions as well. And as a whole, if the neighborhoods work together to plant gardens, that'll help support the pollinator populations, such as butterflies and bees. So if we can build habitats and give them a food source, we can bring bees, butterflies, and bats back to our local communities. And this is what this looks like. So here's a bee shelter. Here's an example of what butterfly shelters would look like. You need to have some tree bark in there so they can make their cocoons. Um, and then this is the examples of what bat shelters look like. Remember, bats are nocturnal, so during the day they need a place to hang out. They hang upside down. So this will give room for just a little small family of bats to be able to seek shelter during the daylight hours. Another example of reconciliation ecology would be rooftop gardens. And here's just an overview of a basic rooftop garden design. So this would be the structural support, which would be like the roof itself. On top of that, you would want to put a membrane so that none of the water ended up reaching down and damaging the structure of the building itself. So then we have a membrane protection, so that protects the roofing membrane and makes sure we don't end up with a hole, it, hole in it, and a root barrier. So this would be a region by which the roots would grow along but not into the roofing membrane. On top of that, another insulatory layer, and then drainage, aeration, and root barrier. 
last but not least, the soil or the growth medium, and then the vegetation itself. And there's a whole series of rooftop garden designs. And the cool thing about rooftop gardens is that they actually benefit the humans as well. Not only does it provide a habitat for these other organisms, but it provides a habitat for humans to go and relax. It also helps safe, save your energy and provide insulation. This helps cool cities. It also helps conserve water. So it's going to help all around. Um, and it also helps with gas exchange, right? Don't forget that these plants are going to be off-gassing oxygen, which is what we need to be able to undergo cellular respiration. So plants are the equal and opposite of humans in terms of bringing in carbon dioxide and off-gassing oxygen, whereas we as humans bring in oxygen and off-gas carbon dioxide. So it'll help increase the oxygen content in these local areas as well. And this is just an example of all of the different types of rooftop gardens that you can see, but you can let your imagination pretty much run wild here. Um, so I'm going to end here on a nice positive note for how we can actually make a change. So I really appreciate you listening to my lecture today, and I hope to see you again soon. Aloha 